Okay, Jan, I'm on? Yes, you are. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Mark Otto. I'm newly past president of the Washington Statistical Society. And we're here today for the Cox Lecture. And the Cox Award is a joint award between RTI and the WSS. It, it's an award for a mid-career statistician that is, um, reflects the ideals of Gertrude Cox. And the competition this year was very tight, but we're very happy to have the winner here giving the lecture, Ching Pan. And Marcus Burkowski is going to introduce her. Yeah, hi everyone, this is Marcus Burkowski. Um, yeah, so as, as Mark said, we're very um, honored to have Ching as our, as our awardee this year. Um, as Mark said, this award is meant to embody Gertrude Cox, and we all thought on the committee that that Ching very well does do that. Um, when, when reading her um, nomination letters, some things really stuck out um, about her that, that also reflect who Gertrude Cox was, first and foremost, that she's a really good mentor to junior staff. She takes them on. She spends lots of time with them um, and is really helpful in bringing them up. Um, also, as a colleague, she is a go-to person um, when colleagues have questions, so she has a wide array of knowledge and can answer questions on a wide array of different statistical topics. Um, so it's very dynamic um, and, um, in terms of her skill set. Um, and then third, um, she's a great collaborator. So even people outside the statistical um, community who she works with, you know, in terms of uh, substantive experts in various topics, um, all sort of um, indicated how well she communicates and works with them. Um, all things that Gertrude um, reflected and felt was really important as a statistician to do and help to grow the community both inside and outside when working with other people. So as Mark said, we're really honored to, to hear from Ching today. And so I won't spend more time belaboring. I'll, I'll hand it over to her and let her, let her all um, talk to us. So thank you. Oh. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's it's such a huge honor. So when people stand on the on the Oscar, like the Academy Award, they say it's a dream come true. But for me, this is beyond a dream come true because I never dreamed to compare my career, my contribution to that of uh, Mrs. Cox. That's like uh, she, she's such a a role model, leading figure, but I feel so honored. Um, but uh, after I'm informed, uh, I begin to think like, how to evaluate a statistician, like your contribution to science, your, you know, how good you are, uh, your record, everything. So I think there's uh, three aspects to that. First is uh, you need to be able to do theoretical derivations. Uh, I've known a real case, someone wrote a paper in one week and got published because it's uh, he reads a paper and he can prove it. It's a theorem and he can prove it with another data type. So that's one thing we are good at. And the other thing is nowadays with big data and uh, artificial intelligence, uh, statisticians uh, contribute and we are very good at programming. We, uh, we have our own GitHub page, people download uh, our packages written by statisticians. Uh, the third aspect is the um, collaborative, collaborative work because science is no longer the one hero uh, work anymore. It's, uh, it's always a huge team like nowadays the most impactful research, like deep mind, like human genome project, like the protein, the prediction of the protein structures, it's by hundreds of people from very diverse uh, fields working together. Uh, so statisticians, we are collaborators, we are an essential part of many research teams and we are, uh, we, you, you can't do it without statisticians. So I think, um, for any statistician, your contribution can be um, evaluated for these three aspects. And uh, for me, I think what I'm really enthusiastic about and uh, I'm I think I'm good at is the third part. I'm a really good collaborator and uh, 
uh, team player. Um, so the title of the talk is Risk Predictions with Applications in Medicine and the Law. This is uh, the title I used in the proposal, the fir very first proposal I wrote at GW. I was uh, first, year, I just joined the GW. I was an uh, uh, assistant professor just out of a graduate school. And I was applying for summer stipend. <laughs> it's for arts and science, you get paid for nine months. So you have to apply for your summer funding. And uh, after 15 years, now I look back, I think this title, this study still works for me with applications in medicine and the law. That's really shaped my whole uh, research career, like the two fields I interested and I uh, worked and I published on. So, um, so as I said, I'm a good collaborator and uh, I work in both medicine and law. So I'm trained as a biostatistician. So I worked in uh, the longest project I worked on is diabetes prevention program, but it started in 93. It is the best monitored and maintained diabetes prevention trial in US. In Europe, in China, they have in Japan, they have their own diabetes trials, but this is the one for US. In fact, uh, it was mentioned several times in NIH report to Congress for the significant impact and the findings. And I'm a statistician uh, in this huge group. I also with, uh, work with Scott in the antibacterial resistance leadership group. And uh, on the legal side, on the legal side, I've consulted for private firms as well as uh, government. Um, and uh, uh, these are a few cases, uh, projects I worked with Department of Justice, and uh, most of them involve uh, illegal immigrants issues. Because the lawyer, Christina, she is in charge of the, in the DOJ, she in charge of many uh, illegal immigrant cases about the treatment and handling uh, to guarantee the process is fair, is transparent, it's humane. So uh, like this case, this was uh, 2019, I think, it's right before the COVID. Um, so a little details was about uh, unaccompanied uh, children, in illegal immigrant children, they entered the country not without parents. And uh, so there are all kinds of uh, statistical issues because it's an observational study and you have the national data. So uh, almost like a registry uh, compared to electronic health records, this is electronic legal records. So it's like whether uh, uh, they, they can't, for children, they are especially vulnerable. They may not speak the language. They don't have the knowledge. They don't even have the maturity to handle compl such complicated, difficult situations. So whether they have a legal representation, there is a study, would that help? Would that improve their, um, their success rate in the immigration court? And this case is about age out. Is when uh, uh, on the 18th birthday of uh, illegal immigrant uh, children, they become an adult, then the ICE, uh, the, there's, uh, depending on which they, where they are, an ICE officer will have to decide uh, whether to send them to some, um, some guardians, like they have an uncle, they have a friend in US, or to send them to some detention facility. And this study is about uh, the dis discrepancy uh, uh, across different geographic offices, the, the success rates or the, the decisions, uh, the distribution of the decisions. Some detains most of the age out, some release most of them, and uh, which factors affect those things, like whether it could be explained by the government rules. And uh, I remember uh, I was explaining in court uh, the random forest, the uh, classification and regression tree. So I testified as an expert witness in DC district court. And I explained like a logistic regression cannot really explain the outcome because the process, there are many interactions of combinations of factors involved. So the process is more like a tree. And the judge and the lawyers, 
even they never took machine learning uh, introduction to machine learning, they, they understood and they, they bought that. So it's a very interesting experience is working with smart people. Anyway, these are a glance of projects I worked at and I totally enjoyed uh, each of them. So today I will talk about two specific papers. Uh, one is uh, from, uh, one from uh, Biostat, and I was lucky to work with Hamoud and Raji. Hamoud is a, a researcher at uh, uh, NCI, and NCI is the top of the field in risk modeling, risk prediction. Yes, uh, for cancer prevention is the most important. So prediction risk is extremely important and they are really good. So I'm very lucky learned a lot from them. So, and May, May, May is my PhD student. Uh, we haven't published, so, but we will definitely work on that. And uh, uh, this paper is about colorectal cancer and uh, uh, it is a uh, uh, common cancer. It's more often in men and uh, it's a uh, hi higher risk for obese people. And uh, if it's a late stage, uh, it, it, it has pretty high uh, death rate. And uh, the good thing about colorectal cancer screening is when doctors identify those polyps, it's called adenomas, uh, they usually remove it. So once it's removed, then they completely removed the possibility of cancer. So that's great. So colorectal cancer screening colonoscopy is extra important. And our goal when we started was um, when you follow subjects for long time, their risk of uh, cancer and advanced adenoma change over time. People, their conditions are changing and their screening results are constantly being updated. So our goal is to make real-time uh, uh, update of the screening, the, the pre risk prediction. Uh, so there are a lot of papers on this topic, in fact, like sometimes it's called a dynamic risk prediction or real-time updates. The idea is uh, as time goes on, your risk prediction changes. So your predicted risk is also a process over time. And we're lucky uh, we have access to this uh, very well-maintained prostate, lung, colorectal, and ovarian cancer screening trial. So this is a trial collect uh, observational data of uh, different screenings, different kinds of screenings, and people on the treatment arm have more screenings by study design. It started in 1993 and followed until the last day of 2009. And specifically, we use the data from the SCU ancillary study, uh, which sampled uh, uh, like, uh, 5,000 some participants of the PLCO trial. And the difference of the data for the SCU subjects is they not only have the screening uh, by design by the treatment, they also collected information of any other screening, so the out-of-study screening and their results uh, or their cancer occurrence, all the information was or recorded. So look at this data. It's, um, we are interested in the occurrence of adenoma and advanced adenoma. So advanced adenoma is just you have extra large adenoma or you have a large number of adenoma. So the adenoma has developed in a more advanced stage. And, but the problem is uh, you don't know the exact occurrence time of adenomas when they occur. What you observe is at each screening time, uh, you observe the status of the adenoma growing process. It could be zero, could be one, two, three. So it's a recurrent event data and interval sensor. So that's called a panel count data. And furthermore, the screening process the clinic times, they are not independent. They are not like designed by experiment. This is real life electronic health records. So they are uh, correlated with the risks of adenoma. Usually, naturally we think people with higher risk tend to uh, be more willing to get screening. But uh, there are other factors you, we, we, couldn't, we didn't collect about their uh, 
reasons going back for screening. But that's the characteristics of our data. So for this kind of uh, panel count data with informative screening time, uh, we followed the literature from, uh, this is a whole pipeline from Mei Chun Wang and Huang Yu Chen from John Hopkins. Uh, so basically this worked, the developed estimating equations for recurrent events, for frailty, and uh, for additive models and uh, time varying covariates. And uh, uh, my collaborator Raji, she published a paper uh, along these lines, but she allowed left truncation. Uh, so there are already a lot of methodology, uh, methodological papers on this topic. So let's see what we did. So the, no, the notations, uh, notations uh, we have I subject, J's e screening interval, case, uh, case adenoma recurrent adenoma events, and then TS and TA, S is for screening, A is for adenoma, so I, J, K, S, and A. So we assume the two Cox proportional hazards models. For the screening process, it's relatively easier because you do know the exact screening time. So it's a recurrent process, but you know the time points. So we can do the profile likelihood. Notice uh, the at-risk indicator for the J's screening is only one after you had your J minus one screening. So you after you have your second screening, you are at risk for the third screen. For the adenoma process, as I explained, uh, the data is uh, more difficult, more challenging. If we write out the full likelihood and try to integrate those missing, um, missing adenoma occurrence times, uh, it's super complicated. I'm not sure it's feasible, like theoretically. However, this is, uh, this is idea in Huang and Wang. So it's instead of using the full likelihood, we can use the conditional likelihood, conditional probabilities, conditional on, you know, you know the screening time, you know the total number of events, you know how long they've been at risk and the, to uh, the, the total number of screenings. So, so the probability that uh, adenoma occurred in this S interval is proportionate to the ratio of the cumulative hazard. So it's like a non-homogeneous person process. So we, we define this new F function, which is the baseline cumulative hazard function at time T over the baseline cumulative hazard at the end of follow-up, which is tau. Tau is a fixed time point. So this denominator is a constant across all the subjects. It does not change with I, with J, with K. It's a constant. That's the smart part. And furthermore, it, this F can be viewed as a CDF function. So it's not the real CDF function for our TA. But if there is a CDF function like this, it, it would generate interval censored data, NIJA. So using that idea, you could estimate this F using Turnbull. Turnbull is uh, for interval censored, you know within interval how many events occurred. So following that idea, uh, first we write out the score function for Poisson uh, distributions because the NIJA for each interval is a Poisson random variable. And here, the, the, there is a lambda zero at TA, right? That's hard. But how do we do that? Uh, we just uh, divide each term by lambda zero TA and multiply each term by lambda zero tau. So then this becomes F inverse. And we know how to estimate F from the Turnbull algorithm. So we plug in F hat. This lambda zero tau, we don't know, but it's a constant. So we can estimate as an intercept. So here is the estimating equation for beta. For the baseline, uh, baseline 
we could do Breslau or Lean, but that would be super complicated because our ultimate goal is to do prediction. As long as the prediction are close enough, we don't have to be so accurate. So we approximate the baseline uh, in, uh, intensity with piecewise, piecewise exponential. So uh, on each piece, it's a time piece. It's a constant uh, intensity rate. And then use the Poisson, oh no, yeah, use the Poisson score functions. We can estimate the parameters for each piece, the lambda, uh, yeah, lambda zero, one, lambda zero, two, lambda zero, three. And uh, then in order to make prediction, you, re you really need to estimate everything, not only the beta, the baseline, you also need to estimate the frequency. And we used the borrow strength idea uh, also from the 2004 uh, Huang and Wang paper. So this is just like a method of moment. The expectation of Nija, it's a function of lambda zero, or lambda zero, lambda zero t and exponential x beta and z, right? And uh, lambda zero can be estimated as a product of lambda zero tau times f. And exponential x beta, we just estimated a beta. So we plug in all these. And because we have multiple intervals, for each interval, you will get a zi, because we assume this zi is constant across for the same subject. So we just take the average across all the intervals. And the only restriction of this borrow strength method is this x has to be fixed over time. If you have time varying covariate, you can't do this. Which uh, we, that's why we don't use it on the screening process. We use it on the adenoma process. Finally, it comes to our goal. We started wanted to wanting to make predictions, and finally we have every piece to make a reasonable prediction. So this is the Poisson PDF probability uh, for having an NA number of uh, adenoma event. And then we sum over zero to you know, a threshold, one or two or three, and one minus that is the probability I have a large number of adenomas. So that's called advanced adenoma. There is a problem with Z. For future subject, you don't know what is their frailty Z. However, we've estimated the Z hat for all the observed subjects. So we can estimate the density for Z. So we did a kernel density estimate for FZ and integrate over the distribution of Z. So that's like averaging over the distribution of Z. So that's one kind of estimate is assuming you know uh, the time points in the future when he would come back. Like for a patient say, I want to know my risk of advanced adenoma in three years or in five years. If it's too high, I will come back, right? But sometimes you don't know when a patient would come back. For example, a, a clinician or researcher, he wants to label those people at high risk uh, for the, uh, with high risk at the next screening. But he don't, they don't know when the patient plans to come back or would he come back at all. So how do we handle the unknown uh, screening time, future screening time? What we did was we model the distribution of the screening times because we do have a Cox model for that, right? And then again, we take expectation over the distribution of the screening times and we use the Riemann sum because it's too complicated to treat it continuous. So we cut them into a hundred small intervals. So there are two different ways to make the predictions it depends on, you know the future screening time or you don't know it. And the variance, uh, the variance, we use the bootstrap. It's possible to do it with influence function Taylor expansion. It just gets too complicated for our predictions. Anyway, let's come to the real data. Uh, we have uh, at baseline, we can see that uh, which factors are associated with the risk of denoma is men have higher risk, obesity people have higher risk, uh, white people have higher risk, uh, at the baseline, you have a, a positive result, you have a higher risk, or if you ever smoke before, you have a higher risk. Same similar patterns for the advanced 
And then we fitted our models. We used, uh, um, we didn't use too many covariates. We used the ones that's accepted by the clinic community. So you can see that for the adenoma process, so recurrent adenoma process, it could be adenoma, could be advanced adenoma. Males, males have much higher relative risk, 62% higher. And uh, if you had a negative results, screening results at baseline, you have much lower risk. Or if you have a BMI less than 18.5, you have a much, much lower, almost a zero risk. So that's for the adenoma process. For the screening process, older people have less chance, less probability of coming back for screening. Older means older than 60. And uh, male have less chance of getting screening. Even they are at much higher risk of adenoma, they screen less. And uh, negative results have uh, lead to less chance. On the opposite, positive screening results in the previous screening had 66.5% higher risk of uh, coming back for the next screening. So those all make sense. They uh, uh, kind of line up with uh, previous clinic papers. And our predictions is, uh, this is, uh, we made our predictions for everyone, every interval in the SCU trial. And you can see that our point estimates is pretty close to the observed percentages in the real data. And we made three hypothetical uh, future subjects, a male, with baseline adenoma, a female with baseline adenoma, or a female with negative baseline results. So there is a where separated risks. Finally, uh, we compared our model to a quick and dirty Cox model, which ignored the difference of adenoma occurrence time and screening time. So basically, they treat interval sensor data as right censored. So uh, we improved the AUC from 61% to 78%. So some summary of this method is, uh, so instead of using full likelihood, we used estimating equations based on conditional likelihood, um, which um, sometimes your data has all the latent variables and uh, complicated structures, uh, it makes sense. It's, uh, you get unbiased, right, anyway. And uh, we simplify our model by assuming piecewise constant intensity rate at baseline, um, which oh, even it's, it may not be the truth, but it works good enough for, uh, for prediction purpose. Same thing, estimating equations for estimating the frailty. And uh, in order to get rid of the frailty and the unknown, uh, screening time in the prediction, we use the numeric integrations. So you can see it's computationally intensive, but it's uh, adjusted to make it feasible and still satisfy the needs of uh, the clinic questions. Still, uh, even for our paper, we think um, people could challenge it. For example, how do you know that conditional on your on, uh, on the real data, condition on the frailty of two processes are independent. We don't know, we assumed that. How do you verify that? Second thing is, if you want to apply your model from the, you know, 19th, the trial started in 90s, 93, so a trial from 90s, uh, if you want to use that to predict uh, the risks for future subjects, how do you know that like, a subject would still fit your model? Uh, we don't know. It had for a lot of prediction models. Uh, what is your target population? It has to be well defined, and it's a difficult question. And the third question, uh, I think it's a in general research question is nowadays there are more and more prediction methods like machine learning and computer science. They use uh, sometimes like uh, very computationally intensive, very complicated but uh, sometimes they just have some empirical ad hoc uh, criteria optimization. It works a lot of times. Uh, if your method gets popular, it must have good performance in terms of accuracy. But computer science papers, they rarely talk about variance. They give a prediction without uncertainty, without 
standard errors, which for statisticians, uh, we know any estimate is associated with certain level of uncertainty. So how to do variance estimate for complicated uh, prediction methods, machine learning methods, um, usually they are not based on likelihood. So delta method, uh, information, yeah, robust sandwich method, those no longer applies. So more method needs to be developed. Okay. Uh, that's my first topic. So let's go to a slightly uh, different uh, topic. So it's uh, based on two papers I published with my mentor, Professor Gasworth. So he is the one who got me in this field and he is, I'm super lucky that he is the leading figure in this field. He has two books that almost everyone in legal stat reads. So, so let's see the story. Um, so the city of Milwaukee had a law case. They were sued by 17 white male police officers for reverse discrimination in the promotion to captain process. So what happened is their police chief, Arthur Jones, is African-American. And uh, when he was the chief uh, for seven years, 96 to 2003, um, he, he he just promoted the, the females and the minorities. So at the district court, uh, the evidence was so persuasive. So the city of Milwaukee was found guilty. The, the liability is uh, for sure. But uh, so at the district court, they ordered two kinds of uh, compensations. The compensatory damages, which is, you know, because you were not promoted your salary would be lower and uh, what's the difference in salary, right? Should you be promoted? So that's the compensation. The other one is the punitive damages is because of the discrimination you suffered psychologically, your health, everything, your quality of life. So those are punitive damages. Uh, so the, uh, the, defendant, um, the defendant appealed and uh, at the seventh circuit court, the liability, there is ambiguity. There's no ambiguity. It's so strong evidence. However, for the calculation of damages, there were some issues and it was reversed, which means you go back, recalculate to make a deal with the plaintiffs. So, so this kind of data, it's about a promotion process. And, but those police officers, some they waited so long, they retired. So the retirement would terminate the promotion. So that's called a semi-competing risk. First, I want to say there are non-parametric, Bayesian parametric, all kinds of methods have been, all the stati uh, statistical methods have been applied to those equal employment data. So for this specific semi-competing risk, we followed um, the framework of a uh, cab of flash uh, and a fine, JSON fine. So basically we, we don't model the hypothetical process we model the observed process. So what do you observe? You observed the promotion process conditional on someone not retired. You also observe the retirement process. So the retirement process is identifiable, although the promotion, hypothetical promotion process after retirement is unidentifiable, but in our case, we are not interested. We don't observe it, but we are not interested. And the quantity we estimate is called a restricted mean lifetime. So it's similar to residual mean, um, residual mean. instead of expectation of T, uh, like in the future, like larger than the current T, we estimate the expectation of T restricted to a specific time period of interest. So here would be seven years and which Essentially, it's just the integral of the survival curve over the seven years. And this has been used in Biostat a lot to measure the effects of treatment and everything. So we have two processes. P1 is you become eligible for promotion. You can't be promoted anytime. First, you have to be eligible. Like there's all the ranks in the police department. And then P2 star is the actual promotion time may or may not be observed. And same thing for R1 and R2. And C is the censoring time. And these are different scenarios. Uh, someone might 
be eligible but never promoted, like retired before promotion, or someone might be eligible but censored, not promoted, not retired, or someone could be eligible, uh, promoted, then retired. So all kinds of scenarios. And uh, I want to uh, mention something about the time axis. We use the calendar time. The reason is that when a department makes uh, pick someone for promotion, like there is an opening on the captain level, they want to pick a lieutenant for promotion. They will consider at that calendar time, all people eligible uh, for captain in the department, right? So we have to maintain the calendar time as time axis. So the risk set in Cox models agree with the set of candidate pool that being considered for the real promotion at the uh, actual time. So, so the conditional probability of picking one out of the risk set, right? And uh, we used the Cox model and uh, uh, we estimated this quantity as I said, the observed process. Given someone is not retired, his probability of being promoted and the hypothetical process of being retired or promoted, we don't care. I mean, we can't model it. Some people make assumptions, but uh, for, for causal inference or other purpose, but we don't. Because for legal case, you only care about what actually happened. So this is uh, the mean, mean residual life. Expect, uh, and here is the estimating equations. We plug in the point estimates for each quantity and we have the variance and point estimate. Let's see how it's applied to real data. So Arthur Jones, uh, he promoted 21 white males and 20 non-white males. However, in the department, there were 112 white male lieutenant and 34 non-white male. So the proportion rates are quite different. Not only that, you can see that uh, the average length it took for, your, for all the white males who were promoted, they waited 7.36 years, while for non-white males, they only wait three, three years. So, so as I, I said in the beginning, for liability, there was no issue, there was no argument. He did discriminate against the white males. And the department is, has too many white males. That was due to historic discrimination toward females and the minorities, but somehow he is doing reverse discrimination now. Anyway, so what we calculate, how do we calculate the compensation? We followed the loss of chance doctrine. So that's a legal uh, term that's where accepted uh, in court. So loss of chance is basically said, um, if you uh, were not promoted, you, and it, you are discriminated, sure, you should be compensated. But what you lost is not a fact. You, it's, like, it's not 100% someone, even without discrimination, someone is not 100% guaranteed to be promoted because there is a candidate pool, only a subset. Everyone has a probability of being promoted. So the, the legal document is very clear. What they lost is a chance. And what they should be compensated is the chance, like 25% of the difference in salary or 30% of what he could have earned or what he could have made, but he didn't. Lots of chance doctrine. So let's see the, our data analysis. You can see that for the promotion process, of course, white male is discriminated, but the only significant factor is years since lieutenant. That's seniority. If you wait long enough, uh, you have higher chance. And we, we had a um, square term because later you will see the, some of the curves, it plateaued. So that's, uh, you know, if you wait too long, then the chance goes down again. And uh, for the retirement process, it's years before lieutenant and uh, years eligible for retirement, which is true because um, in the police department, most people, if they can, they wait until they become eligible for stipend. Like they get 70% of 
uh, of their highest annual salary before retirement. So usually people wait until they become eligible for the 70%. And here are, we have 17 plaintiffs. So we plotted the probability of being a captain, hypothetical probability without discrimination of being a captain for each of the 17. And you can see that for the junior ones, the probability going up. For the senior ones, sometimes it start going down because they waited too long and maybe the department just doesn't want to promote them or they decided to retire. So here is uh, the actual time being lieutenant, being captain and being retired and our hypothetical time without discrimination. So you can see that every plaintiff, their actual time on the lieutenant rank is longer than what they should have been. And here is a comparison of our predictions versus the ones used in court. And uh, some are close, but uh, not, not really that close. And sometimes we are smaller and sometimes, um, sometimes we are higher. So I don't know the, how the court made their predictions. They don't have any models. They don't have any real data. I think it's more like a negotiation process. Uh, they just say you should have been promoted in 2000 or you should have been promoted in 2001. So they, they make some hypothetical time. And if the uh, plaintiff accepts that, that's it. It's more like a negotiation package. So uh, that's the case. And uh, in the analysis, you can see there are some difference uh, doing this analysis, right? Uh, compared to clinical trials or like, uh, 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 biostat studies. So, so first, the purpose is to compensate. The calculate compensation is purpose is to be fair, to put the individuals that were discriminated uh, in a fair environment. Had they not been discriminated, they should be treated the same as uh, the group, the protected member group. There are some arguments here. Is uh, should we use the protected group, the non-white male group data as standard to calculate the probability of white males? Because if you do that, think about it, white males were discriminated. So the non-white males got more than what they should have, right? Had there been no discrimination, the, non, the number of promotions among the non-white males should be lower. But now we are using the non-white males as standard to calculate the probability of promotion for white males. So the no, total number of promotions will be more than what it should have been, the total number of available positions. But uh, this is not really solved. There are still papers uh, on this issue in legal stat document, uh, paper journals, like should you scale back or should you just use the non-white males as standard because they got what they want, what, the more or less they, they got those, my white males should match up. And about covariate selections, instead of cho take, uh, uh, choosing two associations, uh, we are more concerned like, are these factors real? Would the plaintiffs and uh, defendants accept those factors? Are they reasonable? Like only factors that were actually used as criteria in promotion, you can use it. And other factors, even if it's associated, but if it's not a criteria, you should not adjust for it because you should not use it as a criteria, right? Um, and you cannot say that the defendant cannot say frailty or omitted variables, where in that we do frailty all the time. Like my first paper, we assumed that ZI and we even predicted the distribution of ZI. But in court, you cannot say I have an omitted variable that could explain the disparity. Then the other side's lawyer will say, show me this variable, whatever magic variable, show me evidence. So you can't use latent variables uh, in court. Uh, and the goal, the ultimate goal of uh, legal stat analysis, we are really not after causal inference. I mean, because the results, we cannot generalize it to some target population or other departments. Um, and uh, the, the 
the criteria is more logic, is more likely than not in civil cases. In criminal cases, then you have to be very sure he, he, is, uh, he is a killer or whatever, he committed the crime. But in civil cases, most of the time is both sides accept or the judge believes it's more likely than not with all the evidence. It's not a scientific truth. It's a causal, like the counterfactual framework causal inference. Okay, that's my two stories. I hope you have enjoyed it because I did. I liked uh, both projects and uh, with handling the real data and learning a lot of things. So uh, since I do win this award, the Cox Award this year, so maybe I did do something right with my own career. So looking back, um, I have some suggestions for junior statisticians because they are our future, right? If you're just starting your career. Um, first is do not restrict yourself. Don't think I'm a biostatistician, so I'm not going to work on legal stat data. Don't think I'm a statistician, so I'm not going to read computer science journals. Open, open your mind, open to new data, new methods. They are all opportunities. You keep enriching your two skill set, your toolbox. Uh, number two is choose, if you can, choose topics with real life significance. So that's what I realized uh, for the whole field of statistics. We need work on important questions that people are concerned about. People want to know the answers. We don't want to be a theoretical field that we just prove something that no one cares. Um, in the long term, like it will decide how the field goes. We will get, attract more and more smart people, more and more projects, more and more opportunities for everyone uh, because we are competing. We are in competition with computer science, with data science, with epidemiology, with all the other fields. Everyone try to work on important problems, we should do that too. In the short term, I think for junior statisticians is if you work on real life prob important problems, there is higher chance for you to get a grant, right? <laughs> um, third, and the most important advice from my own career is communication is extremely important. It's not taught that much in graduate school because when you do tests, you test like mathematical statistics. Uh, you know, uh, longitudinal data, survival data, non-parametric. However, while working with real data, communication is as important as, or even more important than those skills. As you have written communication, you need to write proposals, write papers, uh, make posters, and you have oral communications, you need to go to conferences, you present in research meetings. Basically, you need to share your idea. You need to persuade people that your methods are useful. Persuade them to work with you, to give you money, um, make you important. So don't be shy. Uh, speak up, communication, talk with different people. Finally, the last slide, I want to uh, thank my genius collaborators. So here are their pictures. I had a lot of fun collecting their pictures. Um, um, so if you see, see, like I read somewhere, if you want to be successful, you, you hang out with them. So my lesson is you want to be a good statistician, you work with smart people. So I learn from my collaborators all the time. If I have achieved anything, I'm super lucky to have them. Okay, that's my talk today. Uh, we can uh, handle questions. Well, I guess I'll try a question. Um, when when you did this, this, the cancer screening, you said you used the variables the clinicians used. Um, would you have, but it might be that if there were other variables that might add a lot of value or something that 
clinicians may not have thought of. So I don't know, was, did you look at anything um, like, like that? Yes, it's variable selection, right? In real, di real life data is always messy. Um, you know, uh, so we, um, I think the correct way to do it is if you do believe some factor is, is important, is a causal or with uh, not only, not, not necessarily causal, but at least a strong association, you should persuade the clinicians. You should maybe first publish a paper with this association as discovery. Um, but in the end, if you want people to use your method, you want them to accept your method. So uh, any factor, it should, they should accept it instead of using, I don't know, uh, smoking. Smoking is important or maybe uh, diet, like I, if I eat pork or not. I mean, if it's real, then there should be evidence in the data. Uh, then, uh, then the clinicians, they are not dumb. They are super smart. They would accept that. But we cannot just use anything if it's not accepted. In fact, I had a real experience when I was building the prediction model for diabetes. Uh, we found uh, smoking has, uh, has a protective effects for diabetes in our data, in the diabetes prevention trial data. We, we just couldn't explain it. I discussed with the clinicians, different clinicians, back and forth, we couldn't explain it. So in the end, to be safe, we didn't add that. Because how do you explain that smoking reduced the risk of cancer, or no, reduced the risk of diabetes? We can't explain that, we don't trust it. It's in our data, but we didn't use it. Thank you, Dr. Pan. I wondered if I could ask a question. I'm sorry, I have my video off, I'll turn it on. Um, I going as well to the uh, data on adenoma and screening. I wondered about the role of potential confounders. For example, I was imagining that you know high BMI or even the presence of a high risk adenoma would increase your risk of death uh, from colon cancer or from another cause. H how did you deal with that in your model? That's uh, for all the cancer predictions. It's definitely uh, there could be unmeasured factors. Um, so we, we make a huge assumption. We assume it's in Z. We have this magic Z that include all the factors we did not measure. Um, that, that's a huge assumption. I think Hamoud uh, and I, we both agree, we are not sure how well the Z summarize those uh, other risk factors. But for the V and X, we use the ones we, we trust, we believe. There definitely be other ones. And it's a big assumption, but we just don't have better ways right now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, this is Hormuz Katki. <laughs> Hello, Hormuz. Ching, and, and congratulations <laughs> on, 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 on this award. It's, it's very, very well deserved. I'm so happy for you and just enjoyed working with you so long, so much over the years and look forward to many more years of working together. And I'm, I'm so happy to have in introduced you to the, to the problem of colorectal cancer screening. Exactly, yeah. Knowing That's that right. you are the person who, uh, who really knows this field well, I'm, I'm so glad that interested you in this and you've done such wonderful work in this area. <laughs> The question I wanted to ask you was was about the was about the police data, and and this, this is sort of a, a an extra an extra statistical question, in in the sense that you know, I'm thinking about fairness here, and and I know that you you came in this you you have a, a question involving this legal case, and um and and these and these and this very and, the, and this very important statistical question that you're going after. But I can't help but think about the, 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 the fairness question here, which is that, which is that I'm not an expert on Milwaukee and its police department, but, but my understanding is that there has been a long problem in the city and the, and the department there about, about historic discrimination and prejudice. And, 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 and I'm, I'm just trying to think about what is, what is a way forward in, for, for this, for, for these kinds of questions where there's been where there's been terrible discrimination in promotion in the past 
that we're trying to make up for uh, in terms of, of of equity and 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 we and and I just thinking to myself I, I'm wondering if is it possible for there to be a, a, an approach where you can you can gather data on the reasons uh, for promotion that there's that, that there'd be data on hard data on um, on aspects that are that are known that are important for promotion to being captain and if we have historic data on that we can we can estimate sort of what has historically been the historic standard for promotion and then how can we then apply that going forward uh, the the idea the, the hopeful idea here i think the to make progress on fairness would be that that no one in the advantage group wouldn't be promoted based on past standards for promotion but for the disadvantaged groups, we we may um, hopefully we find people who who would not have been promoted before who would be promoted now now that there are more objective standards hopefully through this approach. Um, uh, but I, I'm, I'm wondering what you think about the, those basic fairness it's, questions. So it's so different story doing variable selection on legal cases. Like the first case I talked about the uh, the the, deten the decision about the detention or release about age out illegal immigrant illegal uh, children age out illegal uh, illegal immigrant children unaccompanied you cannot use historical data and uh, do variable selection and fishing around for associations you cannot uh, whatever happened in the history may not be correct the only criteria the only covariates that would stand in court are the ones that's clearly specified in the rules like these are the, like, like you have a faculty handbook. It's clearly specified for the promotion or tenure. You should have publications. You should publish on theoretical journals. You should publish on, you know, uh, you should have funding. You should teach. You should have teaching evaluations. So only that's clearly specified as criteria can be used. You cannot just use anywhere because because otherwise people don't buy it. You can't use whatever used in history. What if the history like they like native speakers compared to foreigners because foreigner has an accent. That's not acceptable as a promotion criteria. Correct, Correct. very good point. I see your point. Mm -hmm. It may be very hard to use historic data to develop objective standards. It, it has, the rule is, it has to be accepted by both sides has to fly, has to be so solid that the other side cannot argue it's a wrong criteria, it should not adjust for it. Same story for frailty. You cannot argue there is a magic frailty. Wonderful, thank you so much. And once again, congratulations. Uh, it's so interesting, your real face and your picture. Uh, <laughs> I connected online. <laughs> you didn't <Bye>. shave. <laughs> I, I, I try to choose the best picture possible and then, and then freeze it for all time. <laughs> well, I let's see, I think we're at the end of the hour. Um, uh, Joseph, you have a question or comment? Uh, I, just, I, I just wanted to say something. Uh, Hormuz is right that there's a there is a big problem in balancing historical discrimination. <clears throat> and the way this would probably be doable is, is, is not <clears throat> penalize the uh, lieutenants, but you would change, uh, you would make a more affirmative action in hiring. And the other thing that has been done in courts, <clears throat> it was done by Justice Breyer when he was on the First Circuit, if you found historical discrimination in the past, what you might do is when you come to seniority, put a limit to how much, uh, how much seniority you would get credit for. In other words, you might say in Milwaukee, the minimum was one year, but of course you would expect people with two or three years. But it, I think in the Boston case, it was called Stuart v. Roche. The court said you can consider seniority but cap it at three years. So everybody who was three or more years were considered at the same. So there are ways of doing it, which 
weren't quite as blatant as this. And in, in, in the uh, one thing that uh, Professor Penn, of course, you couldn't go through all the every every single data point. There were some people who were promoted actually before they even had the one year uh, required length of time. And you know, you, I'm sure you, uh, many of you from the government, you know, from civil service, if you have to have a certain, uh, you know, that's a pretty strict requirement. So the liability was very clear. And uh, uh, so that's all. But I think the easiest way is, is to is to have a very good affirmative action at the hiring process to make up for the history. And that's been done in many, in many places. That's all I want to mention. Thank you, Joe. My pleasure. It's really great to see uh, Ching win the prize. <laughs> I'm so lucky to work with all these <laughs> successful people, including Joe. <laughs> Smart okay. and successful people. All right, Ching, thank you. Those were two real, very different topics and your advice for future statisticians was, was wonderful. We're at the end of the hour. So congratulations again, and thank you for the interesting questions. And I'm gonna close, you have a good evening.